בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, שבוע טוב, שבוע מבורך. We are a little over uh, a week left before ראש השנה, and we're back here continuing our series on the uh, Jewish ideology. ברוך השם, we have a lot going on. Uh, of course, the Yetzara has to interfere with everything that's any good. So a little bit of update on that as well. Um, tonight's uh, shiur uh, will be for a refua um, shlema for Rabbi Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara bat Anat, uh, Rabbanit Levana bat Sara, David ben Esriya, Doris bat Jora, Itro uh, ben Avraham, Talia bat Sara, Orit bat Ilana, Rivka bat Sara, Tinok ben Rivka, Hodaya uh, Bat Sara, and uh, also for a Atzlacha uh, Rabah for Tova Bat Chava, Chava Bat Sara, Michal Bat Tova, Sivan Bat Tova, Tanya Sara Bat Tova, Yosef Ben Nabiha, Chaim Ben Tanya, Nabiha Bat Rachel, Chaim Ben Jamila, Eli Ben Nabiha, Julia bat Nabiha, Marsha bat Julie, Ayla bat Marsha, Samuel ben Marsha, Sephas ben Marsha, Alexander ben Marsha, Louis ben Marsha, Shaul ben Farzane, Ruben Chaim ben Pala Parel, also for Zivug Agun, Itro ben Avraham, uh, David ben Asriya, Oshri bat uh, ben uh, Jora, Gabi ben, uh, I'm sorry, Oshri, uh, David ben uh, Jora, Oshri ben Doris, Gabi ben Doris, Elad ben Doris, Joshua ben Noach, Netanel Yosef ben Avraham, Amir ben Shahin, and all of Am Israel, and all of the righteous Noahide, all of the people that continue to support us, that continue to help us do all the wonderful things that we're doing. Okay, so a little bit of update and we'll get to the business at hand, Bezat Hashem. Uh, so, uh, we have our campaign, Baruch Hashem, we have a, uh, a few hundred thousand that uh, we've already sent ahead of time uh, to, uh, to Eretz Yisrael to, uh, to, to feed the people, Baruch Hashem, and a lot of people are already starting to collect the, the food that they need. It's a very uh, lengthy process, takes a uh, lot of work, Baruch Hashem, so thank you very much for all of the people that are behind it, that are doing everything, giving it to the people, making special envelopes. Uh, for each and every family, making sure that we're giving it to the right people. For all of the people that want to support the Rosh Hashanah campaign to, to feed the people, if you have the means, please donate on bhrh.org. Uh, we have three different options. You can donate uh, 4000 a little over 8000 or 50000 Whatever your pocket allows you to do it. Uh, do it. It's for your own benefit, not anybody else's. Uh, the people that will eat will eat one way or the other, but it's always nice that it's coming from your hand. May we all be on the, uh, the hand that gives rather than the hand that receives. For people that don't have the means to give that uh, larger amount for uh, uh, one reason or another, or simply Hashem did not bless them with uh, that much uh, money to, to, to give towards Staka. Uh, remember, you have to also give Maasel. And this is the end of the year, so this is the time that people close their accounts as far as ma'asel. This is the time that you should give your ma'asel uh, if you haven't given it all year round. And uh, for people that simply just don't have and you still want to contribute to help uh, us uh, get to more people, feed more people, we're trying to reach 15,000 people this year for Rosh Hashanah, which is, uh, I think, something like uh, six or seven times what we did the year before on Rosh Hashanah. But nonetheless, the, uh, the reach increased, and we figured that uh, the, uh, uh, so did the need, and uh, so did Bezat Hashem, our emuna. We're uh, trying to uh, uh, have more emuna in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, show our emuna that we are trying to reach many more people. So uh, for anyone that wants to contribute but can't contribute the larger amount, you could simply donate on our website, BezatHashem.org. Or you could donate on the app, or you can donate on bhdonate.org. There's a bunch of different places you could donate for our organization. Uh, and you could just simply uh, get, send us a little text message or a note. 
uh, letting us know that you're donating for this specific cause if you'd like uh, for us to make sure that this money goes for that uh, particular campaign but either way whatever you can do do it this is the time that people donate most of their money uh, in uh, in Klal Yisrael during the high holidays as we're all trying to make our account look as pleasing as possible in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu when he's reviewing every single one of us like a shepherd reviews his sheep when he counts them. And that's really what the Gemara in Maseret Rosh Hashanah says that on the uh, Rosh Hashanah is the Bed Din. It's the, it, it's, the, uh, it's the judgment day. It's when there's the Bed Din, the heavenly Bed Din reviews each and every single one of us. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes each one of us as if we are sheep walking on a very, very narrow road uh, off of uh, where on the right or the left, we would fall off of the mountain. And he, we, he, we have one way to go to the entrance for him to be able to count us and review what he has. This is how precise the actual accounting is for anybody that wants better panasa, for anyone that wants to want, find a good wife, anyone that wants to find a good husband, have a child, uh, you know, whether it's you have a major troubles in your hands right now and you want those troubles to simply go away, health problems, lawsuits, all types of issues, this is the time where all of it is decided. All of those people that are so worried about the coronavirus or they're worried about the vaccine or whatever else that they're worried about, this is the time to change the deen. This is the time where HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided last year that all of those people are going to die in whatever way they died, whether it was coronavirus, it was the vaccine, or it was any other way that Hashem decided, this is the time where HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides uh, during Rosh Hashanah. So that's why a lot of people will try to sweeten the judgment in Shemaim by realizing that, okay, maybe we weren't the best that we possibly could be during this last year, but let's at least have a strong end. And that's the uh, that's why the custom is to uh, to, to do as much as possible uh, during this time, do as much as possible tshuva, do as much as possible chesed, and that's in essence what we're trying to do ourselves. If anybody wants to join, they're more than welcome to. If they don't want to join, they could uh, don't have to. Uh, no, no problem. No, uh, no, no, uh, no problem at all. Uh, but again, as we all know, that uh, uh, the Gemara also says that this is the time where Hakadosh Baruch Hu opens the book of the living and opens the book of the dead. Now, of course, to open the book of the living, we understand we're all here. Hakadosh Baruch Hu opens each one of our books to see what kind of actions did we do over the last year? Did we learn Torah? Did we do Chesed? Did we keep Shabbat like we're supposed to? Did we say Lashon Hara? Did we say bad things? Did we uh, watch our eyes? What did we do? What did we not do? He reviews each and every single one of us because we are the living. And based on that judgment, he decides a whole entire year for us of how much money we're going to make, or chas shalom, how much money we'll lose, how much uh, you know we'll, we'll spend helping people, and how much time we'll have to use people's help, whether we will be the giving hand or the receiving hand. May we always be the giving hand. And the uh, everything that a person has uh, in his life, that's when it's decided whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. This is a judgment date for all of creation. The Gemara says that there's four different judgment days throughout the year. This is the main one for all of creation. So the key is to do as much as possible. Now the question is, fine, we know that the, uh, this is the, uh, he opens the book for the living, but what about the dead? Why does he open the book of the dead? They already died, they're already in heaven, or they're in uh, Gehenom. Why do I uh, need to worry once I die? Because in Judaism, we have a very clear understanding that life does not end here. Life is just simply taking a, uh, a trip here where we get here to do some work, to gather as many mitzvot as possible. But real life only begins after life here in this world. And that life is eternal. It's either an eternal heaven or an eternal genom. Uh, or it's a combination of both. But the point being is, is that a person needs to understand that the judgment is repeated on a regular basis every single year for every single creation. Why would the dead be judged again if they were already judged after they died? Very simple. Each one of us 
takes actions and many of those actions leave fruit leave fruit out there we leave something out there you open a store that's open on shabbat now you may have not realized how bad it is to open a business on shabbat but the reality is it's bad torah says it's bad torah says that it's death penalty for a jew to work on shabbat now you may think that the punishment for that may end with your life but that's a mistake why because after you leave this world and your children take over the store and they also desecrate shabbat because their father opened the store on shabbat so all they're doing is following what their father or their mother did guess what when the book of judgments is opened in shamayim on the on the on the big day on the big and awesome day of Rosh Hashanah, Hashem, look, says, look, we have more sins coming from such and such. We have more sins coming from such and such. Look at all of those people that came to the store. Look at all the transactions that took place in the store on Shabbat and so on and so forth. And the bill gets worse and worse. On the other hand, if somebody does something good, he writes a good sefer that's full of chizuk and people continue to get closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. if he donates money to help people do tshuva, if he does all types of kinds of chesed to help people. Those actions are not just a one-time thing. Those actions bear fruits. You helped somebody do tshuva because you donated some money to Be'ezrat Hashem. You wrote a book. You help somebody do a mitzvah and so on and so forth. What happens? That person continues to do mitzvot even after you leave this world. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu opens the big book and he says, look at him. Look at Reuven over here. He wrote a book. That book, people continue to read it. People continue to get closer to Hashem because of it. Oh, look at Steve over here. He donated to help somebody do tshuva. Let's see what that other person is doing. Ah, this person, not only did he do tshuva, but he's still doing tshuva and he's still getting close to Hashem and he's still putting on tefillin every day and he's still saying bracha before he eats and he's still giving charity every day and he married a tzaddikah and they're having little tzaddikim kids and all of the merits for the entire family go to that person's account that's Steve's account that donated a few dollars to make sure that he has something built up in the next world one person told me recently listen I know you left Wall Street, but for me, you're still an investment firm. You're an investment firm for my Olam Abba. I know my Olam Abba. I'm relying on you. That's where I invest my money. And Baruch Hashem, to have such responsibility, but nonetheless, it is a big responsibility. And people need to think twice before they invest in places they don't know. They invest in places they're not familiar with the work. All they see is they see a big website, but they don't really know where the money goes. And that's why I try to make it a policy at our at our company at our organization to show people to show people all the different videos of people receiving food of obviously constant videos that we publicize every single day with lectures and all types of chuba stories and books and and uh, newsletters and all types of things where people can actually see their investments at work and they could see it not only on themselves they could see it with their friends and it's amazing always to hear stories from all walks of people from all walks of life all corners of the world tell me ah listen i can't believe it i went to the market and i ran into somebody and we started talking before you know it you came up and he told me he knows who you are he told me watch your shurim i didn't know there's people that watch your shurim in venezuela i didn't know there's people watching your shurim in abu dhabi i didn't know there's people watching your shurim in all types of places around the world but there is so that's the key when a person sees other people are benefiting from that fruits who knows if that particular person is only watching the shulim because of you because you donated a few dollars because you shared that lecture and 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 the key is for a person to understand when you're investing in anything relating to tzedakah it's very very important for you to know that the money is used for a good thing and not just going to line pockets not going to just build houses now the key is to understand that if you are uh, dealing with Talmidei Chachamim, you're dealing with trustworthy people, then you have done all the work you need to do in order to make sure that your tzedakah is going to the right places. But unfortunately today, a lot of people are more inclined to invest into things for that have a side benefit, where they'll invest their tzedakah money, their maser, because they're getting some type of tax write-off. They'll invest 
their maasel because the organization is extraordinarily big and they figure that if it's big it must be doing something good they invest because there is a uh you know their friend invested these are not valid reasons you have to make sure that you invest your uh eternity money much wisely much more wisely than you do your uh, your physical money that stays in this world whether it's in a stock market or bitcoin or real estate before people invest in these things they ask 5,000 questions i know i was in the business for almost 20 years people ask 5,000 questions before they send a few million dollars or a few hundred thousand whatever it is they ask a lot of questions they want to know where their money is going where is it going to clear who's going to hold it how do i get it back if i want it do you this do you have email do you have that but that when it comes to donations people write checks of tens of thousands of dollars without asking twice why they figure listen this is a rabbi this is a or, or religious organization it must be good it doesn't really work that way it doesn't really work that way even though there are many good organizations there are many good people unfortunately there are also at least just as many criminals that's just the reality of things and people need to understand that if you invested your money in a bad place that means that you invested your money in an organization that instead of helping people do tshuva all they do is they tell people listen come to our synagogue and you can eat with us drink with us have a uh you know have a session to get drunk we'll tell you you're going to heaven and that's it you my friend are not going to get any reward for that uh for that staka that you gave in fact most likely you'll get punished for it why because you misused you misused your tzedakah money and Rabbi Nachman Mibreslav says people that misuse their tzedakah money are the equivalent of wasting seed that's how bad it is to waste tzedakah money so it's very important for a person to understand that whole movie of tikkun abrit is not just about you know wasting seed physically but it's also wasting money people invest in simply the wrong places they'll donate an endless amount of money to the local shul that doesn't need it they'll they'll donate an endless amount of money to an organization that says we are taking kids out of public school and into uh uh yeshiva okay great Uh, how many people did you get last year oh we got 300 kids to go to yeshiva last year wait but you raised three million dollars you raised three million dollars for 300 kids three million dollars you might as well open a yeshiva but that's people don't ask those kinds of questions why because they don't think they don't think unfortunately it's it's important for people to understand that if you're going to donate money this is your eternity this is your eternity now of course a person would you know like to believe that the people that are pitching him to invest in his uh staka are good people and yeah sometimes they are but uh, sometimes they're not or sometimes the people behind the scenes are not so you have to make sure you know what you're doing now this has a lot to do with everything that the Chazonish is talking about why because now that we're getting to the end of uh, chapter three in this Emunah Bitachon Sefer we see that the Chazonish is not just a person that spoke but rather a person that did you know everything that he's writing here are things that he himself saw he himself did he himself practiced and there are endless stories about the Chazonish and his Kedusha and how he lived his life to give us a little bit of an example of what it means to be a uh, person that has not only knowledge of the Torah as far as Allah, but also knowledge of how to practice it, which is from Musa. Because there was a uh, once a uh, story we've said before, but it's worth to say again, that a... Uh, the Chazonish was invited to a, a very big wedding event and of course when people found out that the Chazonish is coming surely everybody made sure to RSVP the Gdola Do is coming to a wedding surely we want to uh we want to join also even if we're busy even if we're uh away and that's what happened so lots and lots of people showed up to this wedding now they obviously since some of the people came to fulfill the mitzvah of making the bride and groom happy and some of the people made the mitzvah of uh making themselves happy by seeing a tzaddik but when they got to the wedding they uh no one saw where the, where's the chazonish so one of the uh Avachim said you know come on let's go look for him and they went looking looking him and his friend found him where right in front right in front of the hall you see the chazonish old man already at the time talking to two old people 
talking to them and you know of course the Talmudim you know they're interested what does the Chazunish talk about maybe maybe these are uh, two angels you know because we know from our uh, from our uh, Masoret we know that the Chachamim sometimes they talk to angels sometimes they talk to different types of tzaddikim that come to them in strange places maybe these are two angels maybe uh he's talking about Kabbalah maybe he's talking about some big deen that's happening so they peek in a little bit try to listen in to see what does the Gedola do talk to talk about to two older people one man and a woman and making hundreds and hundreds of people among them many other Talmidei Chachamim and rabbis waiting for him waiting for him to enter and they see he's talking and talking and talking and as they listen in they hear the Chazuni say yeah a little bit of the red buttons 500 of the red buttons and then 300 of the black buttons and the string make sure that the string is this type of string and it's strong and then you take it this type of fabric and that type of this and this type they're not really these tell me demons like, well is, i don't know if this is kabbalah or, or we have no idea what he's talking about strings buttons no idea the gdola door is talking to these older people for 10 minutes 20 minutes a whole hour a whole hour he's talking to these two people making everybody inside wait surely something was up but what is he talking to them about all types of fabrics and buttons and strings and different colors would the Chazoni start a uh, supermarket what was he starting a a, a, a a Michael store that's going to uh, sell all types of tchotchkes what, what is this so after he finished with the two he said goodbye to them the two left and then the two told me jumped in to replace them and said rabbi this is torah and we need to learn it please what does the rav talk to two older people they we you know about uh, whoa, tell us what is it it's uh, big enough and important enough to make 500 people wait among them other tell me the so the chazuni says to them you see we have a law and our law tells us that if there's a mitzvah that can't be done by anybody else other than yourself then you have to fulfill it you see those two people they're holocaust survivors and they have nothing in the world nothing absolutely nothing in the world no one backing them no one helping them nothing and they came to me and they uh, said they want to you know restart their life and they before the war they had a store for of buttons and all types of fabrics but since they don't know anybody and they don't have anything they needed uh, some help so they came they came to their rabbi they came to me and they said listen rabbi can you help us i said no problem they said well, rabbi do you know anything about this uh, about business yeah sure i know about business i learned Masech Baba Kama, Baba Baba Batra. Baba Metziah, I learned all of the different Gemarot. I know a little, you know, a little bit of a thing or two about business. I learned about it in the Torah. So, since I was their backing, they come, they ask me all these different questions about what to do, what to buy, what to not buy. And I have to do it. But, Kvodarav, why now? He says, because these people needed the help now. They needed my time now and it's my mitzvah of chesed to give them that time okay fine you have to give them the chesed but why does everybody else has to suffer chazoni says chas shalom no one suffered right now we all have an obligation of chesed we're all obligated to do chesed for those that are needed and because of what i did everybody in the room fulfilled an entire hour of chesed they are all enjoying and benefiting from that hour that i spent with that couple to help them to get them back on their feet and to help them feel like they have some support that's the chazonish so not only someone that learned the law and spoke the law and wrote the law but someone that practiced it in in such a fashion that 
we can only imagine we can only imagine to be in such a level where you have such patience you have such love for every single jew to care enough to tell him which button to pick for his little store why so he feels good about the fact that he's starting new and not be uh focused on the trauma that he just went through in a holocaust the machshimam vezicham the nazis of what they did to am israel all of the experiments and all the tortures of Shemish Moviatzil, all of the murders that happened over there. So the Chazonish is one of those people that is teaching us simply what it is, what it is to have a the right ideology, but in the process, he's teaching us how to apply that ideology to your life and teach you how to be a Jew. Because unfortunately today, Rabotai, as anyone that saw the uh, the Shurim last week or the week before, where we talked a little bit about the worldwide confusion that's happening right now uh, because of what's happening with this uh, coronavirus for the last year and a half, uh, and even more so because of the confusion that came out as a result of this coronavirus about how to uh, deal with the whole vaccine, where you have some people saying that everyone should take it and whoever doesn't is jeopardizing other people. I don't necessarily agree with that so much simply because if you took the vaccine, how does another person that didn't take the vaccine jeopardizing you? It doesn't really make much sense. But on the other hand, there's another group of people. What are those group of people? They're the anti-vaxxers. They're the people that are anti the vaccine to the extent where they have become the most zealous people on planet Earth everybody became pinchas lavdil all, all day they're sharing their new research reports and their new news and new newsletter and new ideas and new statistics and that no one really knows if it's even true or not and all of a sudden you have a bunch of people becoming biologists chemists uh scientists uh and all of a sudden everybody knows everything except the rabbis but not just the rabbis the big rabbis the greatest rabbis that gave the instructions to Am Israel to do what they need to do. Some of these gdolim, some of these sages said to take the vaccine, and some said no. Majority said yes. But nonetheless, those anti-vaxxers, no. They know more than the big rabbis. They even make sure that everybody knows not to listen to the big rabbis because maybe they're being bought maybe because they're deaf maybe because they're not really that smart in medicine like uh, like like i am because i watch youtube videos maybe because they don't know science maybe they only know this maybe they only know that and in the process each and every single one of these people on either side that makes fun insults the big rabbis or any talmid chacham in the process got themselves a much worse disease than the virus could ever be a much worse disease or problem than the vaccine could ever be a much worse effect than 5g is theorized to give much worse what did they get themselves they got themselves a curse from shemaim a personalized curse from shemaim to be arur arur is the worst curse in the torah these people that are mocking big Talmidei Chachamim, these people that are saying that Rav Kanievsky doesn't know what he's talking about, or Chas Shalom is saying even worse, saying, no, he's deaf already, he's senile, he's delusional, he, he shouldn't be paskining, he doesn't know what he's talking about, or they're saying the same thing about other rabbis. Those people, they could have a beard longer than the exile and a hat that reaches the heavens, but they've lost their Olam Abba. They've lost their Olam Abad. They've lost everything. They become Arul. They have lost their share of the world to come. And unfortunately, Rabbi Taya Karim, this is happening on both sides. People that are for and people that are against. I would say from my personal experience, it's much more for the people that are against the vaccine. And like I said last week, whether you're for it or you're against it doesn't really make a difference. You can choose whichever way you want to go. You want to take it, don't take it. You want to put it in your cereal. You want to bathe with it. You want to use it as a cream. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Or you simply want to run away from it and make yourself something of a bunker in the, in the mountains. Nobody cares. Nobody needs your videos. 
nobody needs to watch it no one needs to read it why Hashem runs the world and even if you feel like you need to save people don't do it at the cost of your own olamaba by making fun of the big tzaddikim by making fun of Talmidei Chachamim and unfortunately that's what's happening and that's actually one of the greatest proofs one of the greatest proofs that a person is wrong in what they're doing is when they're doing it while making fun of the sages meaning whoever is telling you whatever they're telling you to take it not to take it doesn't make a difference or to do anything else but in the process they're making fun of the Talmidei Chachamim the Tzadikim that person for sure for sure you should not listen to them whatever they're telling you is a cursed uh, information even if whatever they're telling you is right when somebody else says it when they're saying it if you listen to them you will inherit the curse because of them why this is what happens this is what happens they're bearing fruit and all of those people that make different people go against the big rabbis different uh, desecration of Hashem different minimizing of the magnitude of the sages each and every single one of those people simply takes their olam haba, sends it to the sanitation department the spiritual sanitation department and the satana is dancing satana is dancing you want to take it don't want to take it there's hachamim on both sides but don't be stupid and lose your olam haba just because you have a strong opinion about a vaccine and uh, about the medicine or about the uh, anything that's the opposite forget it and unfortunately Rabotai Kareem, a lot of people are trying to become famous through this and a lot of people are ending up becoming infamous as a result and this Rabotai is one of the topics that the Chazunish is now telling us about what is this a person that has wisdom not a stupid person but that wisdom is lacking there's a wisdom test in Judaism there's a wisdom test but that wisdom test is not the same type of wisdom test like you have an IQ test where people say oh this guy got certain complicated problems right in a certain type of uh, uh, fashion in a certain type of timing his IQ according to our estimation is 180 185 200 215 he's the smartest person in the world so on so on and so forth could be the smartest person in the world according to your IQ but could also be the stupidest person on the world like Stephen Hawking Zimach Shimo, that uh, died an atheist now at one point in his life during the 1980s he said that he believes in an intelligent design but later on changed his mind and died an atheist and until this day he is uh, facing the God that created him while the God that created him is punishing him to no end and tell him well, I don't believe in you I don't believe in you while he's being burned burned alive all over again day in day, day, day in day out so that's unfortunately the fruit that he left in the world that's the tree that he planted but the fruit that he left in the world is people that follow him and every single person that follows his teachings and turns into becoming an atheist will have the same results just like everybody that makes people go and insult the rabbis and become weakened in their emunah and Hashem, weakened in their observance of mitzvot, those are the fruits that people are leaving themselves in this world. So when a Kadosh Baruch Hu reviews the book of the dead, even after those people have died, he reviews the book of the dead and he sees that this Steve is no longer religious because some Joe told him not to listen to the big rabbis. Some idiot told him not to uh, you know, pay attention to the old man some moron told them that the, the rabbis don't know what they're talking about and they're pretending to know because they want more money or whatever other reason or like somebody said to, you know about me today he worships the satan because he's saying that anti-vaxxers are wrong you know so i mean how you conclude that i worship the satan from what i said i have no idea but nonetheless a jewish person said this and, and someone that calls himself torah observant jew that person literally his olam haba, garbage pale garbage pale. and there are countless people like this countless people like this that are literally making the satan dance all day and all night like he's in a nightclub he doesn't even have to do anything anymore he doesn't even have to bring them immodesty he doesn't have to bring them any type of filth they're doing the job by themselves by spreading stupidity all over the world and that's unfortunately what's happening now of course the satan sees they were spreading good information so what happened 
just uh, after the week was over, Thursday night, YouTube sends us a message. What's the message? Message is, you have a strike on your account and you're suspended from posting anything new for a week. Why? Because one of your videos was titled Vaccine. We don't have a video discussing vaccine and, and the logistics of it. We don't have a video titled Vaccine. But where do they find this video? It's a private video. It's a private video we had on the channel that that's how we uh, uh, wanted to make sure we know this one is the one you're talking about, a spiritual vaccine, not the physical vaccine. But there's so much Satan in this whole issue that literally YouTube decided that they're going to penalize us for a private video, not even a published video, and put us on suspension for a week. Now, Baruch Hashem, we have multiple channels, but anyone that is not that is not watching this live or wants to get videos from us on YouTube has to subscribe to our other channel. Subscribe to the Be'ezrat Hashem channel because unless this strike is uh, removed miraculously over the next 24 hours, we're not going to be able to post this particular video or any other video on the channel until the strike is finished, which is Be'ezrat Hashem next week. So, if you want to get the videos, you have to subscribe to the other channels. The app, Be'ezrat Hashem, should be able to get the videos. I don't think there should be any issues there. But nonetheless, you see how the Satan is working hard. People are publicizing all types of stupidity all day and all night, and they continue running rampant with them. We don't even publicize anything about this stupidity, but because there's a video that's tied, that has the word vaccine in it, but it's not published. No one ever saw it other than us. No one even made the name up other than us. We just decided that for record keeping, we're just going to title this for a future release. Oh, Satan sent something. Why? Because this is the most important week of your life, Ramutai. This week is the most important week of your life. If you get the right messages this week, they're going to help you prepare for Rosh Hashanah to do serious tshuva. You can sweeten your judgment. If you miss the point during this week, you could miss and waste your entire Rosh Hashanah. This week, we're also supposed to release a major film, a major film called Chibut Kever, surprise film we've been working on for months, and it was supposed to be released this week. Bezat Hashem, we'll try to release it anyways, but it only makes sense if a lot of people subscribe to the other channel, and uh, it's not just going to go to a uh, 10% of the people. Either way, people need to understand that this whole issue is nothing new this whole issue is nothing new why because it doesn't have anything to do with the virus it has to do with emunat chachamim it has to do with yirat shamayim these are two major issues that the chazonish has repeated time and time again and again repeats today where chazonish says indeed ve'omnam en teilat ba'ala lacha aguna ela translation indeed the glory of a person learned in halacha, because that's what we've been talking about over the last few chapters, is not justified unless his wisdom is preceded by fear of heaven. So the first statement already is an atomic bomb to many speakers, many rabbis, and many people in the world today that think that fear of heaven is like a uh, frowned upon, so a small uh you know level to reach uh you shouldn't really focus on it you should focus on loving hashem and all types of other mumbo jumbo here the chazunish says simply a person that knows books by heart knows the entire shas knows shuchan Aruch, knows poski if he does not have fear of heaven all of his knowledge is simply worthless worthless just like it said last week in the parasha last week in parashat kitavo 
הקדוש ברוך הוא gives us a series of curses that to be honest with you you wouldn't even want on your own enemies when you understand what kind of curses these are that HaKadosh Baruch Hu curses people that go against him all types of diseases strange deaths sufferings starvation I mean literally the worst of your nightmares does not have these curses I promise you the worst of your not nightmares the Holocaust fulfilled these curses but usually most people didn't experience all of them here he's saying a person literally can receive all of them for going against the shim it's my much a nightmare and after these curses after these horrible things that scare any normal person to death simply Moshe Rabbeinu says to Am Yisrael at the end of the parasha chapter 22 uh, 28 verse number 69 these are the words of the covenant that Hashem commanded Moshe to seal with the children of Israel in the land of Moab in so many words this is not a scare tactic but rather this is a promise this is part of the covenant just like part of the covenant is to bless Am Yisrael with all the good that they could possibly be in this world and the next for following the Torah there's also these curses that come along with it for us not observing the Torah and if you follow any person's life that doesn't have Torah in it or worse yet somebody that goes against the Torah actively you follow their life long enough you'll see how their life turns from the illusion that it sometimes looks like where it looks good because they have some money it looks good because they got married to somebody good looking or somebody uh, that's uh, famous or whatever the case may be it looks good for one way or another you see how that illusion changes into a reality in this world and you see how their life turns into a cursed life one day she's a celebrity the whole world wants to be her everybody wants to be a people start moving their body just because she moved her body people start painting their face in a certain way just because she painted her face it looks like she's happy because Forbes is showing she made X amount of money it looks like she's happy because there's different albums and different uh, shows and different uh, attention that she's getting everywhere it looks good and then it's reported oh yeah she's addicted to drugs oh yeah her husband yeah he's not a husband anymore he's an ex-husband number two ex-husband not the first she already divorced one this is ex number two ex number three coming soon yeah but she didn't get married yeah she'll get married and she'll get divorced again and you see how their life simply turns into a nightmare just cursed the kids are not sure what to do with their life the parents are alone and miserable addicted to all types of things go into all types of institutions for somebody to help them for somebody to save them from their from themselves from some addiction they have psychological addictions physical addictions both they're miserable they're depressed and the only time they look happy is when there's somebody taking a picture of them and they could show that illusion that only really lasted for 30 seconds while they were taking a picture but that's it before it and after it the real reality of a nightmare is there the divorce is there the addictions are there the misery is there the depression is there the loneliness is there everything is there but the illusion that's in a picture that's what people see so Kadosh Baruch Hu says to us this this person that went against me this family that went against me these people that went against me don't think that they're only going to get punished in the next world they'll see a curse in this life and if you follow people long enough if you're old enough and you follow people long enough or you just simply follow history you see people's lives you see every single one of them lived a cursed life cursed life with little to nothing to talk about the average person the average person 
you compare the average secular person to the average Avrech ben Torah. Let's, let's compare the two. The best of this one versus, let's say, the best of that one. The best of this one, you have somebody that's a celebrity. You have somebody that, I don't know, is somebody that uh, so-called made it in the world. People look up to him. People look up to her. There's all types of magazines with pictures on them. All types of people making sins because of that person. All types of things. Fine, okay. So that phase passes after a few years usually. One year, two years, three years, five years. At the best, maybe a little longer, but 99% of them don't even last that long. Your average football career in the NFL lasts four years. And the money lasts three years beyond that. That's it. I wrote a few papers about the, uh, the, the money that, sa- that uh, athletes make and lose during their lifetime when I was still on Wall Street. Literally, your average person in the sports, in the NFL, in baseball, and other sports, is literally a living tragedy. Career lasts usually less than four years. Most of them are around two and a half years. Some are as long as four years, some much longer, but that's a rare event your Mannings and your uh, 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 other types of athletes that have been in the sport for 20 years are a rare event. Most of them last only about two and a half to four years, depending on the position. Most of them are going to make a fortune. They're going to make 50, $100 million or more. And most of them, almost all of them, by almost all of them, I mean almost 90% of them are going to lose every single penny that they made. Meaning, the entire fortune, the entire $100 million they made, or $150 or $200 million they made, within two to three years of their retirement. Which means that their whole first 20 years of their life, they worked to get to this place. And they're going to benefit from this place for, at the best case scenario, seven years. And it's really not even seven years, because during the end, when you're losing everything, you're not enjoying anything. But the point is, is that... After that, they're a has-been. They're just hoping for somebody to call them so they could show up and maybe make a few dollars for showing face in some uh, some uh, uh, Haagen-Dazs uh, commercial or something. They're just hoping that somebody calls them and they could put their face on some potato chips. They're hoping somebody's going to call them and they could put their face in some watch commercial. That's it. They're hoping someone's going to call them, but in reality, the rest of their life, misery, Most of them don't actually have many skills, so they can't do much. Some of them become uh, uh, broadcasters. 99% of them don't. They go back to doing nothing. A lot of them become complete degenerate gamblers and losers. And that whole thing, that whole blessing turns into a curse. Same applies in other places, other fields, Hollywood and so on. And you see that if you follow their life, it just simply turns into a curse. Even if they have bigger success with more money and in a different field on uh, Wall Street or uh, in some type of company or whatever, you see how their life is. They started off with humble beginnings in some garage. It all looks great. They made it. They're on CNBC. They're telling everybody their idea. Everybody loves it. Everybody's buying into it. You know, they're happy. Their spouse is happy. Everybody's happy. Shareholders are happy. Everybody's making it, printing it, all types of magazines. Once that phase is over, you start seeing the curse begin. Suddenly, a wife of 25 years doesn't want to be with them anymore. The husband of 30 years is cheating on them. The kids, half of them are addicted to drugs. The other half are, you know, have all types of desires that you want no human to have. And each and every single one of them has to go to some type of unique institution to deal with their tendencies and all types of strange things that they have. Strange beliefs, strange addictions. And you see that suddenly the money doesn't matter anymore. Some of them start becoming paranoid, like the guy from uh, McAfee Antivirus. The guy made billions and billions of dollars only to go to prison and li- live his life like some type of fugitive because he was a fugitive and only to get uh, murdered or killed or whatever it was and like some bum in the street. Like even the money that he made, he couldn't really enjoy. And many of them end up living the same type of cursed life. And you see it. Hashem has patience. Shem has a lot of patience and he gives people the blessing. But when he sees that they don't recognize where it comes from, that illusion is no longer necessary. He replaces somebody else. He gives somebody else the illusion. 
and he takes that person he starts giving them their judgment and you see a inevitable downward spiral that literally just cannot be stopped it's, just, it's like an atomic bomb that the, the ignition the the button was already pressed can't stop it. it's finished and that's what happens to every single one of their lives no exception no exception the deeper you look into their closets the more you see how their lives were cursed on the other hand you'll have some of Rech. you'll have some of Rech that perhaps you know perhaps you don't know you have an avrech and a kolal kolal of bezat hashem in, uh, in, in in jerusalem you have in many other kolals all over that avrech what is he doing he's there to learn as far as money is concerned makes whatever he makes whatever kadosh Baruch Hu sends him each and every single month he has his kids he has his wife he learns every day he's not confused about the direction of the world he's not confused about coronavirus all he is confused about is how do i get more torah how do i f- figure out what's the will of hashem in this particular sugya what's the particular uh will of hashem in that one what's the truth here what's the truth that's what he's com- was confused about life he's not confused he just does what he does learns and learns and learns now some of them Baruch Hashem, will have the merit at some point to write a book whether that book will be famous or not that's only uh hashem decides that but they write a book they write a sefer someone's gonna read that sefer and guess what after they live their life in this world when a kadosh baruch Hu opens their account what is he gonna see they live their life they have their troubles they have their good they have their bad but they definitely don't live a cursed life they don't have some downward spiral some divorce cases drug addictions uh you know s- sick types of addictions to all types of uh, uh weird things no they don't have that you're never gonna hear that a Talmit Chacham has a uh, desire to, to do any of these strange things that the Hollywood does. Never going to hear that. Sure, you're going to have certain people within the religious community have their minds off, but it's never going to be a Talmit Chacham. It's never going to be a real big scholar. And even if you found one in history, it's not going to be a large number. It's going to be minor, like statistical anomalies. Because generally speaking, what they live is a blessed life. They fulfill the Torah, they look forward to Shabbat, they look forward to the holidays, they look forward to the mitzvot, they deal with all types of complications, raising their kids, making sure they learn Torah, and they continue the tradition that we've had for 3,333 years. And they continue, and they continue, and they write, and they learn, and they speak, and they write, and they learn, and they speak, and they write, and they learn, and they speak, and some don't speak, and some only write, and some uh, speak, but they don't write, and some do neither, but they just learn, and they become a Rav Kanievsky. And they become some other tzaddik. And they become somebody you never heard of, perhaps. But nonetheless, a kadosh who heard of them. And every year he opens up their account and he sees, wow, look at this Shimon. Look at this Shimon. How many mitzvot he did? Every hour he learned 60, 70,000 mitzvot. Every hour he learned. That day, 600,000 mitzvot. Because he learned even more that day every hour he learned that day 500,000 every hour that day was 150,000 look how much he learned look how many mitzvot look how much blessing I have to give him I owe him a lot of blessing and a kadosh Baruch Hu gives them blessing the money that they have however much or however little is always just enough David Melech says I've been young I've been old but I've never seen a tzaddik starve to death unless there's a decree from Shemaim for everybody but one specific tzaddik starved to death, you're never going to see. Why? Kadosh Baruch Hu says, look at their merits. Look how much I owe them for all the good that they did. They fought for the truth. They lived the truth. And you see, this tzaddik's life is blessed. And all of a sudden, you see the fruits that he's leaving in this world. While the celebrity may leave three or four different husbands with perhaps two or three different mamzerim kids that don't even want to call them, that they say that they're parents. Don't want to admit that that's their parents. They're actually embarrassed that that's their parents. You have these young little tzaddikim say, yeah, my Abba, he's the rabbi. He used to be the rabbi of that shul. My grandfather, he's the rabbi. He used to be the rabbi. He's this one. He's that one. And they know and they're proud of where they come from. The kids are proud of where they come from. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu opens the book after they leave this world. And he sees, oh, look, he wrote, he wrote a book. And that book is in this kolel. That book is this yeshiva. And a few people learned it over there. And a few people learned it over there. And perhaps it got a big siyat over there. The whole yeshiva learned it over there. 
every single letter that they learned is another mitzvah goes to him and not only one person learned thousand people learned thousand people all these letters multiplied and he keeps getting lifted higher and higher in shemaim never ending the elevation of that soul never ends and many of them even merit to have their souls elevated in this world one of the tzaddikim that perhaps you've never heard of is Rav Ephraim, our own dear Rav Ephraim, his grandfather on his mother's side. He was one of the Chachamim of Tunis, Tunisia. His name was uh, Rav Chanus Yamin. Rav Chanus Yamin was one of the uh, Anashim Akdoshim in Tunisia, and uh, he had a very righteous uh, wife, and he is the great grandfather of Rav Ephraim. One time, the, uh, the you know, he comes into uh, his room and he sees instead of the typical cup of coffee he sees there's a bunch maybe a dozen or so and he says Rabbanit Rabbanit Maze what what what's why so much only only I'm only here alone I just went to over there and I came back I see all this coffee so the Rabbanit says to him she was a Ishat Mimat Sadika he says no no this is for your friends that uh, are with you over there i saw you studying with all the people over there so i brought cups of coffee for them too so the chacham the chacham yamin says ah i didn't know you see them too okay they don't drink coffee honey. they don't drink coffee he's studying already with neshamot of tzadikim that come from shemaim to learn torah with him they don't drink coffee though they don't drink coffee but you have to have special holy eyes to see them. He didn't know his wife sees them. He saw his wife is getting the full merit of his Torah also. This tzaddikim rabotei yekarim is, is, is what our Masoret is from. These people keep going higher and higher in Shemaim. Whether you heard of them or you didn't hear from them. This, this story, this story it's giving chizuk to anybody will elevate his neshama. Chacham yamin that already is higher than high. Already in Shemaim with his Kedusha and all the Torah that he, that he learned and spread in the world, his, his, his Neshama will go even higher as a result of this. Why? He gives Chizuk to another person to understand how much to appreciate Chachamim. Needless to say, how much to run away from people that are making fun of Chachamim. And not just ordinary people. I'm talking about big Chachamim people are making fun of. Now how do you know who's the Chacham? Says the Chazonish. Says the Chazonish, a person can know a lot of Torah. He can know a lot of Torah, just like the uh, Chacham, Rabbi Shmuel Rabinovich, who wrote a uh, sefer called a uh, sefer Amaskil. Sefer Amaskil is a sefer where he wrote an acronym for everything. And pretty much wrote an acronym for the entire Shas. Literally, is an acronym for entire Shas. Instead of it being uh, twenty, almost twenty-seven hundred uh, dapim, which is about five thousand plus pages. Literally, in a matter of a handful of pages, ten pages maybe. And he says, if you know the entire Mishnah Avot. By heart, you'll know how to use this Sefer HaMaskil and you'll be able to know the entire Shas by heart. Now, of course, some people got it, some people learned it, and some people understood what's being said there. But is that going to make them Chachamim? No. It's not going to make them Chachamim. They may know the entire Shas by heart, but it's not going to make them Chachamim. Why? The Chazuni says that wisdom, that wisdom of a Chacham, has to be preceded by fear of heaven if you do not have fear of heaven your wisdom will not last your wisdom will not last your wisdom is not wisdom at all torah wisdom cannot exist in a senseless heart in a heart that's closed unfortunately today all of these people that are unfortunately full of tum'ah of the news where they watch so much news, they read so much news, that when you tell them the truth, they're simply close to the truth. 
instead of seeing a reality check coming from a Torah perspective, what do they do? They curse the speaker. They say the speaker is a uh, idol worshiper. He's part of the Erev Rav. He's uh, crazy. All types of things. Why? They cannot see anything past their closed mind. Their hearts are so full of Tumah, they've literally become a rock. And they cannot see anything beyond it. It's literally the Satan has done a job, has done a job over the last year and a half. No one could have expected. People are so closed, so closed as a result of all the Tum'ah that they have spread, all of the Tum'ah that they have acquired, all the news they watch, all the newspapers, all that filth, all that garbage. They're full of it. Instead of learning Torah, instead of learning more tractates in the Gemara, more Alachot, more Da'at Torah, more, more good. What do they do? They've become experts in vaccines. They've become experts in fake news. They've become experts in deciphering fake news and vaccines and all types of other filth. So the moment you send them anything of real value, completely close to it. And that's what the Chazuni says. Even if they had knowledge of the Shas before, even if they had knowledge of Allah before, even if they had knowledge of all types of things before, their hearts are a tomb. Their hearts are closed. They've become senseless. For the principal grasp of, of Torah lies in the refinement of the soul, says the Chazonish. As it rises above the desires of mortal human beings and roams through the higher worlds, tasting the flavor of the desire for the source of wisdom, craving for endless understanding delighting in wisdom and is feeling completely in love with the torah a person that has wisdom has to have this yirat shamayim has to have fear of the almighty has to have it when he has it when he has it how do you know somebody has it he literally is so in love with the Torah, that's his pleasure. You tell him, listen, you want to watch uh, the game with me? Excuse me? What do you mean? Like, we're going to go back and forth. I'll give you a source. You give me a source back. I'll tell you, Gemara, Masech, Baba Kama, look at that page. You're going to tell him, no, no, it's Baba Metziah, look at that page. I'm going to say, no, no, it's Abu Dazra, that page, that page, that, that's the game. No, 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 I don't know that game. I don't know that game. Is that on TV, a cable? No, it's not a cable. No, no, it's me and you. One on one. No, no, I was thinking about maybe we could watch the football game. Huh? Football? Why would I want to watch people hit a ball? Like, how is that going to better my life? No, you know, it's playoffs. Who? Play who? What are you talking about? Why, why would I want to watch a playoff? How is that going to better my life? How is that going to give chinuch to my kids? How are my kids going to find better shiduchim? How am I going to acquire wisdom? What would I say to my creator when I meet him? That I spent the time that he gifted me watching a bunch of oversized men try to kill each other for a piece of leather. What am I going to tell him? That's what you sent me to the world. Somebody's going to ask me, what wisdom do you have about life? What am I going to tell him? Oh, you know, wisdom? <laughs> Got a lot of wisdom, sir. What kind of wisdom do you have? If you're going to buy a melon... That melon, make sure it has a dry leaf attached to it. Don't buy the melon too early in the season. Well, that, that's your life's wisdom? How to buy melons? Well, I mean, I can also tell you, tractors, they may look good, but you got to check that engine. Don't just buy it just because of the way it looks, because it got big tire. That's your life's wisdom? Well, listen, you may have to check with the brothers and the sisters and the cousins before you decide... Where are you really going to live? That's your wisdom in life. How to pick houses, how to pick melons, which tractors to buy. That's your wisdom in life? Well, listen, the best website right now is Twitter. That's really going. A lot of people want to see what I have to say. That's your wisdom in life. A website, a melon, a tractor. This is your wisdom? This is what you've acquired after 50, 60 years? Well... Buy low, sell high. How do you like that one? Well, you invented that one? Buy low, sell high? Oh, no, I think somebody else did it, but I, I use that. 
And how many times did that, that work for you? Buying low, sell high. Well, you know, son, it never really actually worked for me. I tried buying low, but I never ended up buying low. I ended up buying high, and I sold low. Oh, so you know it, but you don't know how to use it. Yeah, something like that. And that's what most people are. Literally, completely clueless. Clueless. They have lived an entire life, and they have nothing to say for it. All they can tell you is all types of filthy stories that they've experienced in their life of how they took advantage of certain people, certain certain people that didn't expect them to, or they uh, did all types of other, you know, unholy things. But to teach you something, something of wisdom, they don't have any of that. They don't have any of that. Acham, that has Yilat Shamaim, all he has is wisdom. All he has is wisdom. Why? Every day, he learns more, and more and more of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants him to learn. So if you ask him about business, he'll tell you about business. He'll ask him about marriage, he'll give you information about marriage. You ask him about children, he'll give you foolproof information about children, about marriage, about everything. Why? It's all here. It's all here. It's all the wisdom that we acquire from the Torah. And after he leaves, he leaves the wisdom with his children, with his grandchildren. And he has something to be proud of. What does a person that made five or ten million dollars have to be proud of? The money that he made he can't take with him. The kids that he has are sometimes embarrassed to admit that he's their parent or she's her, their parent. Why? Because at 65 years old she started pretending she was 16 years old. She didn't like getting older. So the kids little by little started distancing her, themselves away from her because they didn't want their 65 year old senior citizen parent to uh walk next to them because they knew the truth that she's not 16 she's 65 and really everybody else knew that she's 65 but nobody else wanted to say anything because she had a lot of money or she was somebody they felt bad for but that's the reality what does she leave behind what does he leave behind nothing Nothing of value. Nothing of value. That when their judgment in Shemaim is reviewed, Akadosh Baruch Hu opens the book of the dead and all he has is rotten fruits that those people have left. Whereas that Avrech, that person that learned Torah, that person that fulfilled mitzvot, the person that used their time, their resources to publicize Torah, all they have is good fruits. All they have is good fruits, even if they enjoyed things of this world. They enjoyed it in a permissible way. Even though they were extremely wealthy materially in this world, they invested a certain amount of money into the Torah and they used the money the right way, in a kosher way, and they made it in a kosher way. They had Yirat Shemaim. They had that fear of heaven to, that's going to tell them which way to go, right or left. Do I do this deal or not do this deal? This deal is legit, I'm going to do it. It's not legit, I'm not doing it. Yeah, but you can make a lot of money. Sure, I can make a lot of money in a non-legit way, but I'll also go to Gainom. So, not interested. Dosh says, From a thing of lies, run away from. I don't want to make money in a, in, a, in a filthy, lying way. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't think that way because they don't have any wisdom to begin with they're not trying to acquire wisdom and even if somebody tried to show them any type of wisdom since they have no fear of the almighty they run away from wisdom and instead they have a very very abrupt response to wisdom that comes to them face to face where they start insulting wisdom they start cursing at the wisdom they start hating the wisdom and even Rabbi Akiva, before he became Rabbi Akiva, he himself said that before he became Rabbi Akiva, he hated the Chachamim much more than everybody else. He wanted to bite them like a donkey. Much more vicious, much more painful than the, the bite of a dog. Why? Because Rabbi Akiva didn't know what wisdom was. So he lacked it. He lacked wisdom and he lacked the fear of heaven. So therefore, when he saw that the wise people have such a blessed life, that they're getting kavot from everybody, even if they don't have a lot of money, everybody honors them, everybody respects them. 
They have a certain aura about them, a certain light about them. He, and he is just a shepherd. He doesn't understand why there's so much of a difference between him and them. So what if they read a few books? What's the big deal? He doesn't understand the blessing that comes with it. And you see, Rabotai Yekarim, when a person, when a person learns Torah and applies everything that he sees in the Torah to his life, his life turns into a blessing. Why? Because he's not only going to apply the nice stories, he's also going to apply the tough stories. And last week's parasha, we had a whole series of curses. A whole series of curses that we are obligated to study each and every single year. Even if you're six years old, first grade, you have to read this parasha. Same exact thing after you've read it already for a few years. You're 13 years old. You just did your bar mitzvah. You have to read this parasha. 25 years old. You'll have to read this parasha. You're Rav Kanievsky. Already in your 90s. Yishtabach Shimo. Already read the Shas countless times. Already read the Chumash countless times. You still have to read this parasha and apply each and every verse to your life. To your life. Why? Because this fear is how a person is going to test whether they've acquired wisdom or not. Hence the reason why after all of these curses, not only does Moshe Rabbeinu say, this is the covenant, but he also says, In chapter 29, in verse number 3, Moshe Rabbeinu says, But Hashem did not give you a heart to know, or eyes to see, or ears to hear until this day. When did we, when is this day? The day that you understood the obligation you have in fearing the Almighty. Without understanding that fearing the Almighty is an obligation from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, a person simply has no capability of understanding their purpose in the world. No capability of appreciating wisdom for what it is. No capability for understanding what Musar is. You see, many times you'll have certain rabbis or speakers or coaches or whatever they're called today try to please the crowd. Try to talk to the crowd in such a way that they're going to get fans. And many times, they'll in the process, they'll throw the entire Torah in the garbage by telling people that are completely wrong such as that genome and punishment is limited everybody goes there but it's only a washing machine either way maximum amount of time you'll go there is 12 months even though the torah itself says otherwise and i'm not just talking about the uh, the oral torah i'm talking about the rin torah it says otherwise the rin torah says that genome can be eternal hence parashat korach korach is in genome until this day if Genom was maximum 12 months, why is Korach in, this, in Genom until this day, 3,333 years later? Why does the Ramak say that Genom, saying 12 months, that's only a name of a place in Genom? It's not an actual sentence. Why does the Ramban write in Shara Gmul that anyone that says that Genom is 12 months is 100% a heretic that is calling God evil, an evil God? Saying that Genom is a maximum of 12 months and giving all criminals the same judgment turns God into an evil God, says the Ramban, 800 plus years ago. But yet you have people publicizing this nonsense as if it's Torah Sinai, as if Moshe Rabbeinu says that Genom is 12 months. Nowhere in the world will you find a single Chacham saying that Genom is maximum 12 months. Nowhere in the world. No Chacham has ever said it. No Chacham has ever said it. Why? Because it's a Gemara Meforeshet. There's Gemara, Baba Metziah. Gemara in, uh, in, in a, uh, Rosh Hashanah. Gemara in, in several places all over. All over the Torah it says that Genom can be not only more than a year, but eternal forever until the end of this world. Which in a place like Genom could be like literally millions of years. But yet people say, no, this is Kabbalistic. It's not, it's Pshat. But yet people teach this hocus pocus type of Torah. Why? They don't want to scare people. When the 
Chazon Ish, the Gdola Dor from the previous generation, that there's not a single Chacham in the world that is his level. The Gdola Dor is saying that if you want to measure whether you have wisdom or not, that measure, that measuring tape is called Yirat Shamayim. But if everybody gets the same judgment of one year, then why should I be afraid? Whether I murder, I rape, I, I steal, I violate, I'm going to get maximum 12 months one way or the other. So why should I be afraid? Says the Chazonish, you don't have the truth to begin with if you think it's only one year. There's no such thing as one year in Genom. Only a little fairy tale that calls himself rabbi or speaker or motivator or whatever he calls himself says that you're never going to find a single chacham in the world. Write that. You're never going to find a single sefer musa, sefer alacha, sefer chasidut, sefer chokma ever say such stupidity. And in fact, you'll see the opposite. In fact, if you want to acquire chokma. You have to acquire Reshit Chokhmah. What's Reshit Chokhmah? One of the most fundamental Musar books out there. So much so that Rabbi Nachman Breslev was proud that he completed the Reshit Chokhmah 400 times. That was his pride and joy. He didn't tell his students how many times he read the Gemara. He didn't tell his students how many times he completed the Shulchan Aruch. But he was proud to tell his students that he completed the Rashid Chokhmah 400 times. There is a Musar book that I have with all types of Chachamim talking about what kind of Musar they learned. Literally, 8 out of 10 of them say that the Rashid Chokhmah was like, like literally right next to the Chumash for them. They were list, list learning Chumash and Rashid Chokhmah. Chumash, Rashid Chokhmah. Rav Ovadia, Rav Ovadia, Allah Shalom, wrote commentary on Rashid Chokhmah at nine years old. Nine years old, he not only read Rashid Chokhmah, but he already wrote commentary on it at nine years old. These types of books that talk about punishment have always been the fundamental way of how Chachamim acquired Chokhmah. Why? Because unless you are going to make your neshama more 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 soft like it says over here the uh uh the uh Chazoni says that the chokhmah is going to come by adinut anefesh adinut anefesh is when you're softening your neshama you're softening that hard character you're softening that anger you're softening that arrogance you're softening that uh, that jealousy you're softening all those characters little by little and as you're softening your horrible traits you're making an opening for wisdom to enter yourself. People always ask, what's the trick to knowing all these sources? What's the trick to uh, learning so much? The trick is work on yourself. Work on your character traits. Soften yourself. I don't mean become soft like people can kick you in the face and you won't say nothing. Soften your traits. Know when to apply this and know when to apply that. Know how to be zealous and know how to be generous. Know when it's time for you to stand up for something and know when it's time for you to simply crawl like a little puppy. There's a certain time and place for everything. Soften yourself. That's how you're going to make room for chokhmah. How could a person soften themselves? What? They could just tell themselves, listen, I don't want to be arrogant and therefore they'll stop being arrogant. Or say to themselves, I believe in myself. I'm not going to be jealous anymore. And you think that's going to help something? You think that if they say, oh, I don't want to be, uh, you know, stingy anymore. That's going to help you in any way? No. The only way to soften your character is to first and foremost realize not only that it's wrong, but the cost of being wrong. Being wrong, if there's no cost to it, who cares? Who cares? You could tell me, listen, killing people is wrong. Okay, that's your opinion. It's your opinion it's, it's wrong to kill people. Maybe my opinion is otherwise. Hitler said that killing people is nothing wrong with it. As long as it's not his people. If it's Jewish people, if it's people of color, if it's people that have deformities, he actually thought it's a good deed to kill them. 
Who are you to tell him otherwise? But if you now say, no, no, killing is wrong because there's a price. There's a very heavy price that you'll pay. There's a very heavy price that you'll pay for killing people. You'll lose this and lose that and lose this. And all of a sudden, you got my attention. Why? Because just telling me something is wrong is simply not enough. Telling me not to speed is not enough. Telling me not to cheat is not enough. Telling me not to go is not enough. It's not enough for people. You have to tell me what not to do with the cost. With the cost of not listening to you. With the cost of violating these instructions. The cost. That's how I know. That fear that we have in our life is applied to our lives in every single way and every single one of us is afraid of something. Every single day we operate our lives with fear. We're afraid of poverty. We're afraid of loneliness. We're afraid of being late. We're afraid of starvation. We're afraid of being too fat. We're afraid of being sick. We're afraid of having this. We're afraid of not having that. We're afraid of a lot of different things and that's generally how the human being functions. That's how the human being functions. But there's only one fear that's actually important. Being afraid of bugs is not important. Being afraid of a virus is not important. Being afraid of poverty is not important. It's not. Simply not. Why? Because you could be afraid of poverty, but you're a multi-billionaire. So your fear of poverty is complete stupidity. It's a deformity. You're afraid of starvation when you have a five refrigerators full of food. Is, is, is completely unwarranted those fears are not necessarily always going to help you in life but there is one fear that is valuable in fact it's the most valuable and it's the only valuable fear and that fear is called fear of heaven Yirat Shamayim. and says the uh, or israel the or israel by um rabbi israel misalant and also his talmid rabbi Yitzhak blazer right that this fear of heaven is the only fear that does not come to a person naturally people are not born with a natural fear of heaven fear of heaven is something you can only acquire you don't get it automatically how do you acquire a fear of heaven by learning the consequences of your actions hence the reason why all of the chachamim the greater they are the more they were aware of the judgment hence the reason why many of them discussed it whether it's the Baal Shem Tov or it's the Tanya or it's Rabbi Nachman Breslev or it's a Rav Ovadia or it's a the Stipe or it's the Rav Steinemann or Rav Wasserman or Rabbi Akiva or Rabbi Mir Baranes or Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai all of the Chachamim constantly discussed the consequences of lack of fear of heaven meaning actions that show that you don't you're not afraid of Hashem you're not afraid of uh, the judgment they wrote about it extensively and when people would write anything otherwise the Chachamim would fight them tooth and nail in such in such a fashion that the uh, the Gemara says in a Masechet Megillah in Masechet Megillah, that a, uh, a person that minimizes, minimizes the uh, the sin, Masechet Megillah, page 25a, where he minimizes the sin by using a euphemism, where you told him, listen, says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, says the Gemara, says the Zohar, says the Rambam and the Chuva, says all of the different chachamim and even including rabbi yosef karo that wasting seed is like murder wasting seed is like murder wasting seeds gonna get the person to gain home wasting seed is terrible it's you're gonna get serious punishment comes this chacham and says ah i think you're exaggerating it doesn't say murder it says like murder which you know means less that's a euphemism that's inappropriate even if it's not meant intentionally it's an inappropriate way to do things why first of all it's wrong your understanding is wrong second of all any time 
Anytime you talk about sins and the magnitude of sins, you have to be very, very careful before you minimize them. Why? Because that's the character trait of Amalek. You see, who is the worst person in the entire Torah? Who? Who is the worst person? Who are the worst people in the entire Torah? Worse than Paro. Worse than Nebuchadnezzar. Who? Amalek. Amalek is the worst. Worse than Hitler. Amalek. He is a descendant of Amalek. And how does Hashem describe Amalek? How does Hashem describe Amalek? Amalek did not fear God. That's it. That, that's how he describes Amalek. He doesn't describe them, oh, they were murderers, they were rapists, they were uh, pedophiles. No. Hashem says, Amalek, they're the worst of the worst. Why? They were not afraid of God. That's also how Hashem describes Avimelech. When Avram Avinu in Sefer Bereshit comes and they take his wife Sarah. And Avimelech says, how come you didn't tell us she's your wife? Avram says simply, I saw that there's no fear of Hashem in this place and therefore you'll kill me. Meaning, why is Amalek so bad? Why is a person that has no Yirat Shemaim so bad? Because they're always suspect of being a murderer. Bottom line, you don't have Yirat Shemaim, you're always a potential murderer. The fact that you did not murder anybody is not because you're not a murderer. You perhaps didn't have the opportunity or even the desire yet. But you're always suspect of a possible murderer according to the Torah. The worst person on planet Earth, Amalek, is not defined as someone that committed a holocaust, killed millions of people. And no, he's described as someone that has no fear of the Almighty. That's it. That's how he's described. No fear of God, Amalek. So you as the teacher, you as the Chavuta, that you were asked a question or you are reviewing something with your buddy or your student came to you and said something and said to you, look, Rabbi Reuven over here, Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai Le'avdil over here and all the Chachamim saying wasting seed is uh, like murder. So it's terrible, right? And you're saying, listen, everybody does it. You're still young. It's not exactly murder. It's like murder. So... Yeah, listen, and also, it's not karet, so obviously, it's not as bad as other karets. Wrong. First and foremost, the Gemara says that if you would have said this at the time of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, if you would have said this at the time of Rabbi Akiva, if you would have said this at the time of Sanhedrin, Mashtikin Oto, Mashtikin Oto, the Gemara says, what's Mashtikin Oto? Rashi on the Makom says, Mashtikin Oto, they kill him. Yeah, but what? For what? He didn't to kill anybody. He didn't say, no, they, for doing such a thing. They kill him for such a thing. That's, that's what the Gemara says. That's what Rashi says on the place. Look, Gemara, Maseret Megillah. Mashtikin Oto, they kill him. Some say, no, they don't actually kill him, but they give him a few chapchas to make sure he doesn't uh, make fun of the Torah ever again. But some actually say they actually kill the person for minimizing the consequence of a sin. Why? Because that's Amidat Amalek. That's what Amalek does. He has no Yirat Shemaim. So it, what does he do? He causes everybody else to have no Yirat Shemaim. No fear of heaven. How? Saying it's not a big deal. But the truth be known, anyone that actually understands the ramifications of different sins knows that all of these euphemisms are impossible. Impossible for them to be true. Why? Hebrew is not understood like English. When you say, this is like this in English and other languages perhaps, it means that it's like it, but most likely it's lesser. In Sfat Kodesh, when you say, Kmo, uh, that this, uh, this is Kmo uh, uh, Largo, it's like, like killing him, like murder, Kmo Retzach, Kmo Shvichud Damim, it doesn't actually mean that it's like it or lesser, but rather it's like it, but it's potentially and most likely worse than it. How so? The Shulchan Aruch says that wasting seed is the worst sin in the Torah. 
But yet Chachamim say wasting seed is not karet. So how could it be worse sin in the Torah, but it's not karet? Because first and foremost, first and foremost, some Chachamim say it is karet, by the way. But let's say for those Chachamim who say it's not karet, karet doesn't necessarily mean the only bad sins. All sins are bad, and some of them are classified in a category of karet. Doesn't mean that they're the worst ones, because when we look at the worst ones, we have to look at the consequences. Karet is not the only, the worst consequence. You also see a genom. Now, if you look at the Rashid Chokhmah, you see there are certain types of sins that you get this chamber, that chamber, this chamber, that chamber. Wasting seed, a person that wastes seed, or desecrates Shabbat on purpose, or desecrates Hashem's uh, uh, name. Uh, or is uh, with a uh, married woman, all these things without doing tshuva and a few others, goes to the seventh level of genom and never comes out. So obviously, whether it's karet or not, doesn't really make a difference for anyone that did it. Why? They're cut off permanently. They're in eternal suffering. That's number one. So how come, how come the Rashid Chokhmah says, this is, this is the punishment for this seed, this, this is the punishment for this crime, this is the punishment for this thing, but it's a, uh, it's, it's only like murder. Why is it only like murder? Because murder, first and foremost, a murderer doesn't necessarily lose their olam haba. There are opinions that someone that murders still has a share of the world to come. Whereas someone that weighs seed on purpose, all opinions, all opinions say he has no share of the world to come. So yeah, it's like murder, in a sense that it's killing something, but the punishment is actually worse than murder. That's number one. Number two, murder, a person that murders somebody, it's a single sin, single act, single demon, if you will, created. Wasting seed, single act, many, many demons created. Hence the reason why the Shulchan Aruch says it's the worst sin in the Torah because it creates more damage in the lower worlds and the upper worlds than any other sin. More demons are created as a result. That's what Rabbi Yosef Karo says. More damage is created by wasting seed than any other sin. That these, these uh, spirits, demons, whatever you want to call them, they entice the person to sin a lot more after that first sin than any other act. Also, as a side note, the Chafetz Chaim says, look, Lashon Ara is also like murder. But obviously, anybody that's normal says, wait a minute, he says Lashon Ara, the guy's still alive. He shot the guy in the head and the guy is dead. How is him saying Lashon Ara like this, like a uh, murder? How is it like murder? First and foremost, when you said Lashon Ara about him, you could have killed him spiritually. You could have killed him in a lot of different ways. Second of all, the reason why Lashon Ara is like murder and not Mamash murder is because while you killed him with your speech, the murder, the actual real murder, you immediately had remorse. If you're a normal be human being, you're not a sociopath, you're not a Hitler, when you murder somebody, immediately you feel bad. But when you say Lashon Ara, but when you waste seed, when you do some of the other sins that are like murder, many times you don't feel bad. Many times, even if you feel bad, it's only for a moment, and then you go back on your life. That's why it's like murder, because the murder, the murder, you actually continue to feel bad, but you can't fix it. The Lashon Ara, the wasting seed, the, the, the other sins that are like murder, they're only like murder in the act, but not necessarily in the feeling. Meaning, they're worse than murder. They're worse than murder. So, when if you're a teacher or you're a student, and you're going to talk about reward and punishment, you better make sure you did your homework before you speak. Why? minimizing or lowering the judgment is not a good trait it's the opposite it's midat amalek and it actually shows that instead of wisdom you have no wisdom because wisdom is measured by the irat shamayim the fear of heaven now even if a person knows an entire shulchan aruch the entire gemara and every other book under the sun all by heart they're a computer if they don't know how to apply reward and punishment to their life, for sure they'll distort the judgment. The person can give you an entire class about judging things in a certain way. And right after the class, they'll go to a McDonald's and eat a cheeseburger. 
Why? They'll tell you, yeah, uh, I know I'm not supposed to uh, eat this according to the Torah, Shulchan Aruch, this Saif, that Saif, I know, yeah, but I'm hungry. I'm hungry and I judge this pikuach nefesh because I'm hungry. And they'll distort the law because of their lack of fear of heaven. This is why those people that we go against and we expose or other people that we haven't exposed yet that like to speak against Yirat Shamayim, they like to speak against punishment, they like to speak against it because that punishment, that Yirat Shamayim forces them to accept things that are beyond their own uh, logic, beyond their own acceptance. It's in essence, them being forced to accept something they don't, they don't like. And people that have no yirat shamayim, what do they have instead? They have arrogance. And people that are arrogant don't want to be told what to do. They want to do whatever they want. Everybody wants to do whatever they want. But the person that has yirat shamayim has a clear understanding that you simply cannot do whatever you want without having a very, very big price to pay for it. Now, the Chazonish once got a uh, complaint. He got a complaint. What did he get a complaint about? He got a complaint about Rav Shvadron. Rav Shvadron was a extraordinary Talmud Chacham. And to be honest with you, I always knew that he was an extraordinary speaker, but I didn't know how much of a Talmud Chacham he was until recently. He was a huge Gaon, giant Gaon, knew a lot of Torah. On his deathbed, when he wasn't even able to speak, his uh, son and somebody else, some other family member were next to the bed. They thought already that he has lost his ability to think and so on, and they among themselves were talking Torah, and they were trying to figure out what to do with such and such and all of a sudden they hear Ken Avram, Ken Avram. now the son thought that maybe his father is in pain so he's trying to get to his what Abba again Avram, again Avram. he figured oh maybe maybe uh his father is uh is, is trying to pray even though he's laying down so he's saying Tfilat that says, uh, you know, the third blessing says Magen Avraham. The second blessing, first blessing says Magen Avraham. But he keeps saying Magen Avraham, Magen Avraham. He says, what Abba? What do you mean Magen Avraham? Look at Magen Avraham. That's where your answer is for your Allahic. On his deathbed. On his deathbed, he knew he's listening to what they're saying. The Torah became a part of him. A part of him. This Rav Shvadron loved making fun of Abu Dazara, but not just the typical Abu Dazara of Christianity and Buddhism, but Abu Dazara that people simply worshipped sports, worshipped money, worshipped all types of things, and literally turned it into Abu Dazara. One time, so Zionism was another thing you would make fun of regularly, where one time, one of uh, the uh, people in the shul came in and Rav Shwanon looks at his face and he sees, looks sad. Usually the shul is full right now. Everybody's late and this guy, first guy came in, looks sad. Short while later, another guy walks in and he's also sad. So Rav Shwanon says, maybe something bad happened. I'm not, I'm not aware. I've been learning all day. He sees more and more people showing up and everybody's got the same long face. He says, okay, okay, tell me what happened. What happened? It's not for the Rav. It's okay, it's okay. No, 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 no. You owe me an explanation. I need an explanation. What happened? It's not for the Rav. This, see here in uh, Belgium, the way he was visiting Belgium at the time, our national sport is bicycle riding. Bicycle. And the guy that made the record became very famous. He left the sport for a little while and then he just came back to break the record again. But in the process of trying to break the record, he crashed and died. All of a sudden, the Rav Shvadron starts laughing and he's so happy. He starts, hey, 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 hey. Everybody's sad and he's looking, what? What? He goes, 
You said about that. You got much worse news. This is what for the Rav? Much worse news. Back home in Yerushalayim, you have to come with me. This is why for the Rav. Back home in Yerushalayim, I just got the news. Back home in Yerushalayim, horrible news over there. What? The cat in my neighborhood, he was able to jump from the bottom all the way to the top of the tree. One second. Today, I just heard he died. So let's go, let's go mourn. Let's go mourn his death also. It's no different than your athlete that you're admiring is to go mourn some cat that died. Same thing. They would make fun of this stuff, sports and Zionism and, and all types of other stupidity that people fall into. And one of these times, people went to the Chazonish and complained. Complained about Arab Shvadron. So the Chazonish invited Rav Shvadron to come speak to him. Rav Shvadron says, I was petrified. The Gdola Dor invite me to come talk to him. What did I do wrong? Why, why, why? So he comes, and he's a big man. And he comes in. He says, yeah. So the Chazonish says to Rav Shvadron, there's a case against you. I'd like to hear for myself. He says, what, Kvodo? Why, why, what did I, what case? So people are saying that uh, the way you are giving shiurim now is uh, too much joking in it. I'd like to hear for myself. I want you to give me a shiur. Of course, Rav Shpadron can't say no to the Gdola Do, but at the same token, he's not used to speaking just one-on-one. But what can he do? He asked for a shiur. Rav Shpadron says, I closed my eyes. And I imagined there was 500 people. And I started giving a shoe. And every so often, I'd open my eye. And every time I open my eye, I'm watching, I see the Chazonish laughing. Ooh, laughing. And I close my eye again, I keep giving a shoe. And I open my eye, he's laughing. So I know it's okay. At the end of the shoe, the Chazonish says to me, Chazaku Baruch, that's how you give a shoe. That's how you give us you. If there were people like you at the time of the Beta Mikdash, it would not have been destroyed. Because the joking that you do is not only permissible joking, it's mitzvah of joking. You're making fun of the Avodah Zarah. You're making fun of Shtuyot. That is, that is Azut Lek Dusha. That's good. You're making fun of good things. Chazak Baruch. This Rav Shvadron Rabotaye Karim. This Rav Shvadron, one time, he gave a, uh, he saw, he came into the shul, and he saw that uh, the place was uh, empty. Now he's in Yerushalayim, and it's not normal for it to be empty, but within a moment, few people showed up and he understood why is it empty because people went away for the summer people went away for the summer so Rav Shpadron wanted to teach people a little bit of Musa and Bezat Hashem we're going to learn some Musa from it also what kind of Musa he says for the people that are there and the people that will listen to this story too, and the people that have forgotten the story because they heard it before but they forgot it, this is for you. He says, the Magid Mikelem once said this story. So this story has long history. Long history. He says, the Magid, one time he was walking walking coming back from the shul from the synagogue and as soon as he got out he heard crying he just finished learning he's not sure who and where everybody is but he is crying and he tries to find the crying where is the crying where is the crying the magid says I'm strolling slowly through the city streets before sunset. 
and I try to determine the source of the weeping. As I walk towards the house, as I walk towards the house, the crying increased in volume. Where is this crying coming from? Where is the crying coming from? I continued until I reached the doorway of the house. And the cries have not stopped even for a moment. I knocked on the door, but no answer. I rang the bell, but no one opened. I tried my luck and twisted the doorknob with both hands, and it opened. As soon as I opened, the weeping grew louder. Who's crying here, but no one answered? What happened here, but no one's answering? Is it a child? Maybe a youth? Maybe it's an elder that's hungry or cold? Who's crying so much? Who's crying so much, says the Magid Mikelim? I hesitated. Unsure whether or not to go in, but I couldn't handle the crying. I had to see what it is. Maybe I could help him. I gathered my courage and went inside. Immediately as I walked in, I concluded that the crying is coming from inside the closet. Scared, Concerned, but determined. I put my fingers on a latch, open the closet, and everything becomes clear at once. It was the talit. The talit is in the closet and it's crying. And I look at the Talit and I say, why are you crying, Talit? Why are you crying so long and hard? What happened? Sobbing even harder, the Talit says bitterly, my owner has gone off on vacation to the mountains because it's summer. He packed up his belongings. He put his money in his wallet and the wallet in his pants. He packed all his valuables in his suitcase and he went on vacation. I'm the only one that he left behind. I'm all alone here. I was quiet for a few moments, trying to comfort this poor Talit, but not knowing how. All at once, I grew bold. I bent down and I came over to the Talit and I whispered, Don't cry, Talit. The day will come and your owner will leave everything here at home. The day will come and the man who owns this house will separate from everything he possesses. The day will come when there will be true separation. He will leave everything behind except you. He will take you, his talit with him and nothing else. At that moment, Everyone knew what is Da Torah about all of these vacations, all of these getaways, all of these benazmanim that abandoned the Torah and the mitzvot behind. And just like it was true at the time of the Magid Mikelem, it was true at the time of Arab Shvadron when he said the story. And it's even more true today when people are going or returning from vacations on a regular basis 
and forgetting their mitzvot at home. You see, Rabotai, these types of teachings have been the fundamental basis of Judaism. This type of reminder of death is a constant, constant reminder for us that Judgment Day can come at any given day. A person that knows that his judgment can come at any given day, and not just in Rosh Hashanah, not just on Pesach, not just when the Mashiach comes, and not just when there's the resurrection of the dead, but rather every day. A person that knows that every day could be that judgment day thinks differently about how they're going to act today, how they're going to behave today. Now for all of those people that say, yeah, but people don't like it when I give Musal. Well, if you look at Shlomo Amelech, the smartest man that ever lived, Let's see what he said. Shlomo HaMelech says in the book of Mishlei, chapter 28, verse 29, one who rebukes a person will later, later find favor. Mere than, more than one with, flatter, with a flattery tongue. Akadosh Baruch Hu says to us, you that you rebuked your friends, you that you rebuked your students, you that you rebuked your children, and you told them that they're doing things that are against Hashem, they may not like that you did that. They may not like that you reminded them of the day that they're going to die. They may not like that you showed them that movie to remind them of all the things that will happen to all of us. But Hashem likes it. Much more than he likes the flattery tongue. Says Shlomo HaMelech, if you are the Mochiach, Kadosh Baruch Hu loves you. Kadosh Baruch Hu loves you. Much more than what a person would like, a flattery tongue. A person that tells them everything's okay, don't worry, Hashem loves you. You're right, Hashem does love you. If you fulfill the mitzvot. If you fulfill the mitzvot, and He even loves you if you don't fulfill the mitzvot. But He still has a world to run, and His midot are measure for measure. If we fulfill the Torah, the measure for measure is that the Torah will pay us the reward. If we desecrate the Torah, then the Torah will give us the curses instead because that's what the Torah says. So as much as HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves His creation, He has a rule book, not just for His creatures, but also for Himself to make purpose to this whole world. If there's no judgment, there's no purpose if there's no fear of the judgment then the whole world will turn into Sodom and Gomorrah and yet that's what we see the world has deteriorated over the last couple of centuries into Sodom and Gomorrah as atheism has grown to all-time highs as the spread of idolatry has gone to all-time highs as the observance of the Jews has gone to Shem laws were low in the Kedusha and high in the Tuma. And the, the, the results is the world we have. And that's why Rabotai Karim, it's important for us to always know that regardless of what your opinion is, your belief is, your thought is, if you want to make sure that whatever you're saying and whatever you're doing is right, double check with the wise people of the Torah. Double check with the wise people of the Torah. And I'm not just referring to somebody with a beard and a hat. 
talking about the Gedolei Adom. Find yourself a Chavel in the Torah, in the Gemara, in the Poskim. One of the Gedolei Adol is agreeing with what you're saying. But not just part of what you're saying and you're completing the sentence. Find yourself a friend. Why? Because if you, if you say something is right or something is wrong, it may be right, it may be wrong. Because you, like the rest of us, are limited. You're limited in your knowledge and you're also limited in your ability to understand how much Yirat Shemaim is really worth. Are you really afraid to sin? Are you really afraid to say something that's wrong? Not always. Not always. But those tzaddikim that have become the leaders among the generation without voting, without a popularity contest, but rather were designated by Kadosh Baruch Hu through their toil and Torah, through their practice of their wisdom, by Yirat Shemaim. They were gifted that gift of leadership by Hashem because they have fear of heaven. Meaning that before they say something, old or not, deaf or not, popular or not, they're scared to death before they utter a single word. And therefore, they know that every single thing that they're going to say has consequences. Hence the reason why we can rely on them. They don't have a bias. They don't have an opinion. They have da Torah. What's da Torah? By reviewing all of the rules that we have in our Torah and implementing the fear of the Almighty to make sure that we really did review all of the rules and the, and the laws and so on. This is the conclusion. And I'm not going to utter this conclusion unless I'm willing to go to Gehenom for this conclusion. Because if I'm wrong, I'm not just mistaking myself, I'm mistaking a bunch of people, an entire generation perhaps. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes the tzaddik's words come to life, regardless of whether they're right or wrong, scientifically correct or scientifically incorrect. The tzaddik says... HaKadosh Baruch Hu fulfills. Just the Gemara, Masechet Sukkah, page 14a says. The Tzaddik says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu fulfills. Why? He used all of the tools that I gave him. He used all of the tools that he acquired through his fear of heaven. He's only saying this because he's willing to die for it for eternity. And if he's willing to die for eternity, to help my children of course I'm gonna protect everything he says and everything he does and all of those that speak against him all of those that mock him all of those that minimizes all of the words that he says that use euphemisms to make his words seem like they're not a big deal they're awl. they're cursed and that's the best case scenario. Worst case, they're Amalek. Amalek, virtually a lost cause. You see, Rabotai Karim, there are many people in the world today making themselves either Arur or Amalek or both by simply not being capable of shutting their mouth. Why? They watch too much TV. They've idolized the newscasters, the reporters. They've idolized the scientists. They've idolized the politicians. They've idolized the media. They've idolized some crazy speakers out there that tell you all types of mumbo jumbo every day. They've idolized them. But when the rabbis said something, nah, they don't know what they're talking about. <coughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable almost unbelievable how far a person that knows Torah can fall by allowing the Tuma to enter their life one second they were learning Shuchan Aruch next second they were admiring an athlete riding a bicycle 
One second they were learning Daf Yomi, and the next second they were telling you that the biggest rabbis in the world are clueless because they're not aware of the crime that's being performed because of some virus or some vaccine or whatever they create that day. For a person to say that a chacham is clueless, it's incomprehensible to anyone who knows what a chacham is. And they used to know what chachamim were. So how could they do it? Simple. They allowed the satan to park inside their houses, inside their minds, so much so that they've lost their ability to think. They've lost their ability to think without impurity influencing them. So like I said, if you have wisdom that's real wisdom, it's only because you have Yirat Shemaim to go along with it. If you don't have Yirat Shemaim, you don't have fear of the Almighty, you're not thinking twice before you say anything, you're not thinking twice before you do anything, whatever you know, it's no different than fake news. In fact, it could even be more damaging. Let us all gather all the strength that we have and stop all of the fake news spreading all of the nonsense that's out there focus only on our own job in this world of acquiring wisdom acquiring acquiring the tools that are not only going to help us but they're going to help our children they're going to help our grandchildren they're going to help our communities only Hashem runs this world. Not the doctors, not the lawyers, not the politicians. Only Hashem runs this world. And if you want something good to happen, something good will happen. No power in the world can stop Him. If you want something bad to happen, something bad will happen. No power in the world can stop Him. Let's show HaKadosh Baruch Hu that at the very least we understand that concept. By eliminating all of the Tum'ah that we're allowing to enter our minds. No more news, no more media, no more updates. I care less. Simple. Watch Torah lectures, learn Torah books, do whatever work you need to do, and repeat the whole process again. None of the filth that's out there that's distorting so many minds, which is mamash, mamash unbelievable. People even think they're on the good side because they say, no, listen, Rabbi, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I'm just living a healthy life. Okay, great, you're living a healthy life. For what did you do with your time today? Well, I saw in the news that uh, such and such and such and such, uh, there's nothing healthy about your life, Mabi. Nothing, nothing healthy about your life, Habibi. Nothing. You're watching the news, you're watching sports, you're watching all this stuff. Nothing healthy about your life. Nothing. You want health? Learn more Torah. That's you. That's health. That's the best health food that exists in the world. And Bezat Hashem, we all overdose on that healthy food called Torah and Yerat Shemaim. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו בפעיון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, 
לטובה ולברכה. שבכל מה שיפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו. יזכו לעשות כאלה וכאלה. הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. אנחנו עושים בעזרת השם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה. איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. במיאמי. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעביר לו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן. קהילה ספרדית גדולה.